Just a skull. True. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's nobody on the uh, desk. <laughs> Stop. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for coming down. Stop. Oh, we can't. We can't turn this off, can we? <laughs> <laughs> Do some lip syncing. <laughs> we could actually just do it with the music. Yeah. Yeah, it's not. While we're working out how to turn the music off, thanks everybody for coming down tonight. Yeah. Nice good crowd, and thanks uh, you for uh, jumping in on this. Yeah, so what we're going to do is always be a bit too boring just to talk about a book and writing a book, that's too dull. We're going to work out the art of darkness and somebody who's been involved in a journey into the heart of the art of darkness. That's you, isn't it? So let's, let's kind of unravel the, the sort of the layers of this, isn't it? I mean, you have quite a lot of esoteric interests. I mean, not all of them are dark, of course, you know, but they're esoteric and interesting and they sort of link into art and art's part of the journey into it. Is that something you were always interested in or something you got pulled into as you, in your teenage years? Good question, John. Yeah. Uh, um, e evening, everybody, as well. Um, I have no idea. I mean, I think it chooses you. And then you have to, you know, pick up uh, the baton or not. You know. um, but I think you can choose it if you really want to will it through. Um, I mean, it works in many ways, doesn't it? But I think with 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 what we call goth, it's totally connected to all of that. I mean, this is going to be quite a boring question, but did you, you obviously you never thought of yourselves as being a goth band. There's no such thing. But you were quite part of the scene as well, weren't you? You know, you went to the back cave, you knew all the bands. Yeah. Killing Joke are one of the pillars of the scene that they probably don't feel like they're actually in. I mean, what's your actual personal relationship with it? Well, I mean, I miss first wave punk a bit. Um, so, 78, 79, we started Killing Joke and and, uh, and and we're getting busy. And and so that was the beginning of post-punk, I suppose. And then out of that, uh, but again, it wasn't called post-punk, though. Mm. And, and then there was a new romantic thing on the Blitz Club, which preceded Batcave, which is very different but also very similar, uh, and the same crowd. Um, but that was called New Romantic at the time. And, uh, but nobody there called themselves New Romantics, I don't think, apart from maybe um, Spandau Ballet. But certainly, I mean, but that was, a, that was rife with them fighting. They all had, you know, they didn't like Gary Newman. They, you know, they were like fussy about what was what. But then, then when, when the back cake came out, Again, no one was calling it goth. I mean, even oh, that's a Paul Morley <coughs> origin, isn't it? Well, the, the word goth or gothic, is, it's, it's been around. I mean, the yeah. first band to be called gothic was actually The Doors in 1967. Yeah, 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 yeah. Obviously yeah. in the book, but yeah. I mean, that, which is very fitting, isn't it? Because The Doors, yeah, yeah. a lot of stuff we're probably going to yeah. hear, probably a lot of it stems yeah. from Jim Morrison's interest. Yeah, well, that's the interesting angle on it, because what we, what we now call goth is... You know, it's great you start the book with the Visigoths and that whole thing after the fall of Rome. But even, you know, Romantics, which is another element of goth with the writer Shelley, that's, I think that name comes from Romans, right? It's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a, an association with Rome. And not only that, with, with the goth, Gothic architecture and Gothic literature, it's very Catholic. Mm. Uh, so it's very Italian, Spanish, you know, they really get it and they still really get it. And I think what that is, even though it's that on the surface, it's a kind of thin veneer. And then when you, if you look at, if you scratch a bit further, it's actually a remnant of a, a more ancient uh, tradition of, you know, you could call it Dionysian, you could call it... Um, uh, triple goddess. Mm. Uh, it's, it's it's a kind of uh, it's it's a sex and death cult, like like Christianity is in in a, in a weird way. So it's, it's it, that all those things are quite connected. And with the Dionysian element of it, it's it's Dionysian in in the context I mean is 
is is is the opposite to Ap- Apollonian, mm. which is the Western culture today. You could say is Apollonian. It's it's rational. It's regimented. It's it's linear. Um, it's specific. Uh, Dionysian is the other side of that. It's it's poetic. It's it celebrates death and darkness. It's uh, it's kind of goddess muse based. It's uh, it's about visions and all all the things that we love about goth actually. So it's, I mean, in the book, I've got a great quote from Iggy Pop, which I saw on a TV program, an American mm. chat show, mm. where he just explains that to this completely baffled looking host, <laughs> <laughs> and Iggy's at his, his most kind of druggy, wildest eyes out and stalks, but he's explaining the Apollonian and the Dionysian. It's, uh, it's not, that's not the uh, Mokwoi Iggy Pop quote they used on their album. Uh, I think it is, because I think it's the time. He's, 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 talking, he's talking about punk rock. Yeah, and he's talking yeah, about how yeah, he's a yeah. mixture of the two, but yeah, more Dionysian. Absolute genius. I mean, he's yeah. incredibly articulate, Iggy. Mm. Uh, and because his persona, persona was so dumb, it, it completely screwed up uh, a lot of writers and TV guys because they weren't expecting it. It's, it's the genius of it, isn't it? I yeah. mean, I've talked about this a few times, yeah. these things. I mean, the doors are probably half about, but what yeah. he did when he saw the doors mm. when he was at university, yeah. but he reduced all Jim Morrison's poetry to two words, no fun. Yeah. Which is perfect. Oh, wow. I've never heard that. That's amazing. I'm well, really, I've never you, heard that. What else do you need to say in rock and roll? Wow, that's great. I've never even thought Iggy would have been into the doors, but of course, when you mention it, it makes I, sense. I found this amazing website <laughs> from when he was at his university website, nothing yeah. to do with the Stooges, saying, Do you yeah. remember that James Osterberg yeah. and how transfixed he was yeah. on the doors when they yeah. played the gig at our college? Yeah. yeah. And they put in Stooges' yeah. first gig was 11 days yeah. later. Yeah. So. Yeah. So going back to the Dionysian thing, was it, and this, and what you talk about the layers and going to yeah. sleep, all the mm. goddesses, etc. Mm. This all plays out in Killing Joke, and is there a sense yeah. when Killing Joke came together that, well, you know, was it was it something that kind of drew you together? Could you feel that, that there was that similar kind of interest from the other members in this? Or, um, well, interesting. I had a, re- a conversation recently with Jazz about it, and I was talking to him more about. Uh, Robert Graves and um, White Goddess and, and I said I said I think the thread that's gone throughout all of our work Chaz is the triple goddess he was like yeah straight away <laughs> um, so I mean I think it is there but nevertheless before I j- even joined the band I mean Jazz and Paul had been members of uh, The Golden Dawn at 14 <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> and have Paul done rituals in um, in Wickham in, in uh, Town Square? Yeah, you? I think so. Oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. And you know that they've done a ritual to uh, a ceremony ritual to find me and Geordie. Mm-hmm. So the band came out of that kind of magic. So when you walked in the room the first time, did you feel this is not because you've been in bands before? You toured around the UK, yeah. sporting the adverts, yeah. etc. And that being fun, and that's like mm. a punk rock band, do you think you're going to join a punk rock band, or do you feel this strange, I must go to this room, and you went in there and it's like, wow, this is not... It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't like that. There was an ad, and I, I phoned the ad up, and, uh, and then I said, I think Geordie answered. I said, well, come over to my bed set, and I was quite less... I, th- I thought I was auditioning then. That's what they were auditioning me. Has that ever been resolved? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, Eventually, Geordie came out of my bed set and I had a three gu- string guitar in there and he refused to play. He said, look, you're going to have to come up to Charlton, we're rehearsing up there, jazz his mum's up there. And I was like, okay, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and in the end, I went up there and we did this rehearsal and famously, jazz and Paul kind of looked at each other while we were doing the first sort of jam and, and walked out and went down the pub. And they were like, oh, he can't play, it's not going to work. And left me and Geordie in the room. Me and Geordie just started playing this one note thing. And then when they were in the pub, they, um, they, they saw some friends and they were like, oh, how's the new bass player? And just went, yeah, it's great. Like, Can we come down? Right? <laughs> so they came down with a few friends and we're playing this just one note, one note thing, really intense. And it was just like a movie. They just Paul went over to the drums. We didn't stop playing. Jazz went on the keyboard, and boom, that was our first song. Mm. And I so saw I was, you know, I was about to be kicked out before I'd even joined. <laughs> but you, you managed to get in with one note. Yeah. Apparently. <laughs> Very good note. Yeah, yeah. But I think, you know, it's like astrologically, I, I kind of fulfill 
the, the, the opposites to what they are in many ways, you know, and I wasn't really interested in anything esoteric or magic or I used to take the piss out of them for relentlessly mm. when we started. It was only when I had my LSD meltdown at 21 that suddenly everything started to become magical and shamanic and that's when I tapped into that. And one of the first things I really tapped into on that was actually Jim Morrison and the Tours. Mm. Because he d he exemplified that Dionysian darkness and, and goddess uh, elements. And uh, yesterday I was playing around with some mix, mixing some of his poetry with drones and, and I was like, wow, yeah, I mean, it's, it's as much as he was criticised for that, that's what I really love about him. As well. what, the, the words themselves or? Just his... Or what he's aiming at. What he's aiming at and the words themselves actually stand up pretty good, I think. Mm -hmm. And and his whole kind of lizard king shamanic persona and his fearlessness and just putting that out there. Um, I mean, obviously it's tragic he died early, but, you know, it's strange to think both him and Hendrix died at 27, right? Were you nervous at 27? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think I had my sort of metaphorical death at 21 on the King's Road, burning money, and banged up in a nut house for a couple of weeks. But uh, 27, no, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't worried about it. I'd gone through it by then, and I think I'd already been prepared for that with a life before. But I think it was just good timing, you know, and, you know, and then at that point, that would be in 81, 82, that was when the back cave was just emerging and, and all this amazing stuff was emerging but again even at the back cave I, you know what i'm like john i'm quite reactionary so like with punk i'd go out dressed like a teddy uh, like a rocker for the top half and then bondage trousers on the bottom because well, that's a good look that was oh, quite that's it looked great. 77 but yeah 78 that was yeah 77 78 but of course you know, I did end up getting chased a lot, and, and people would say, oh, you're letting the side down, you know. And I'm like, I don't care. Like, for me, punk rock's always about being different, not being the same. And as soon as the identikit thing happens... It's very Apollonian, in a sense. In a way, yeah. Even though and, it's meant to be chaos. Yeah, I kind of avoided it. So similarly with the Batcave, when it all became black and the bats were coming out, and everybody was doing the Nick Cave back home, you know, um, I went the other way and I was getting into hip hop culture. I'd turn up in tennis shorts and visors and... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but actually the scene was very inclusive at the time. Mm. So you would have people from all the other clubs, Blitz and, and lots of other scenes. And nobody would give anybody any grief that I could see. It, that's always when it seems at its best, isn't it? Before anybody's formulise what it's about, isn't it? I mean, yeah. what I tried to do in the book was actually deconstruct it back again. So yeah. it's, and just chuck all the ideas up in the air and see yeah. what lands, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But I think it's like on a on a cultural level that it's where, where that when the shadow and the darkness becomes important is when the light has left you let you down. So, like when the politics of the day has left you as a generation on the scrap heap, or you know uh, things like nuclear politics at the time, all of that. Um, allowed you, to, you couldn't find music that spoke to you um, in, in the charts at the time. So the music that spoke to us that, that of, of our experience was the darker, more underground, underbelly stuff. So I mean, was that what you were trying to uh, sort of articulate in Early Killing Joke as well, when you, when you, before your meltdown? No, I don't think we were, we were trying to be anything. So was it, was it more intuitive? Yeah. Yeah. So it yeah. wasn't like you, you sort of think we have to make something that reflects anything. Of course, nobody ever does that, do they? But it, no. just, it just came out that way. You were trying to be something completely different, but it still comes out like a joke. We all had our, idea, our own ideas of what it should be, but when, he, when we actually played together with something else that nobody <laughs> expected, and that all of us wanted, you know. <laughs> but that's what it was, and, and that's that's the magic of it. Mm. But, you know, it's, uh, you know, we, I wasn't saying to Jazz, can you go more Jim Morrison Hill or anything <laughs> like that, you know. It was just, you do your thing, I'll do my thing, you know, put it together. I think that's a very defining thing about a lot of post-punk and a lot of stuff in the Gossip, a lot of bands I wrote about in this book, because mm. everybody in every band seems to be playing something different at the same time. <laughs> and somehow it works, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's often the, you know, those naive mistakes of what 
mm. actually draw people in. And but everyone's playing lead as well. I mean, the, the bass didn't tuck in the back, did it? Like, well, that's that's cool. Cool. Yeah. But it was a good time for bass yeah. because guitar oh, solos nice. were out the window. You know? yeah. <laughs> but a nice melodic bass run that was considered a melancholy one, you know. Yeah, and, and Peter Hook was the master of that course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You told him, didn't you, Joy Fisher? We did, yeah, and uh, that was mind-blowing thinking about it now. And even it's mind-blowing thinking the two bands being on one bill. I mean, that's yeah. a double dose of intensity there. Yeah, and so di quite different, but actually worked very well. Mm. Yeah. So, so when you had the meltdown and you started to sort of reappreciate the doors, I mean, was that like a door, literally a door, it, into all these other ideas of the poets, did you kind of go down the whole trip, or was it this a gradual process? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I got totally immersed in poetry, bardic, druidism, uh, all of that became, took on a whole other level, and then, and then music around me that was resonating on that level took on a level as well. But, uh, so what, what, what would be the music that was resonating? On that level. Well, coming out of that, I was, you know, it was a weird mashup of New York electro, early hip hop meets, you know, sort of psychedelic folk, folk you know, the incredible string band, <laughs> you know, uh, traditional folk music really resonated with me, um, blues, you know, sort of, uh, you know, things that had a kind of un adulterated uh, like a purity to purity it. clarity yeah. to it of, uh, of authenticity what was this resonating with you at the time you trying to like almost piece yourself back together from, from the meltdown yeah you know, i think it just came across as uh, you know authentic mm -hmm. you know where it went where i was surrounded by a lot of what i thought was plastic fake but i quite like the plastic fake as well i mean a lot of those early hip-hop electro new york records Totally plastic, but yeah, great. Yeah, well, they're, they're like a folk music of their time now, yeah. aren't they? So, yeah, you yeah. to you having yeah. a meltdown now, yeah. look at that as a folk yeah, music. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But, yeah. So, did, was, it, was it lyrically as well, like the folk stuff, like the hip hop, very lyrical types of yeah. music? I mean, and also, weirdly enough, you'd see that coming in on the dance floor on, on, at the Bat Cave. I mean, the Bat Cave was really important because of two DJs, Rusty and and Hamish McDonald and Hamish particularly would bring in things that became like all about even uh, you know a, a sort of kind of those folky even um, Cult Sanctuary had this kind of acoustic folky romanticism to it you know and uh, that was very diff you know did starkly different from uh, two even two three years earlier with punk so that all started creeping onto the dance floor via a drum machine and and you know that that was really interesting you could see the scene was kind of going into these different areas that no one had really gone to and i think after punk nobody knew where it was going to go either i mean what were you doing at that time were you were did you go to the bank cave or something no i was in, I was in blackpool so yeah. we had a little a very small version yeah. of it, you know. Yeah. Well, I think one of the interesting things I found in the book was a lot of people doing really interesting stuff in small towns, yeah. pre-internet, yeah. convergent evolutions, you know. Yeah. When you think Bauhaus coming out of Northampton, yeah. I don't know if anybody here is from Northampton or been to Northampton, but not a lot goes on there. Yeah. And the idea that, that mm. there's four, them four actually even live yeah. there, but end up in a band together yeah. and come up with Bella Goes Dead, their yeah. first rehearsal, yeah. it's quite mind-blowing. Yeah. So in, in a way, you didn't have to be the back no. in London. Sure, I mean, it's hip, really. I, I, th I think the North, uh, East and West, were, were totally perfect for the beginnings of goth. And, you know, if you think about... Um, you know, who, who else was there at the time that was coming? I mean, I, I go down the back cave with Zodiac, Mind Warp, who was from Bradford, Bradford yeah. right? And Buzz, who was from Southern Death Cult, mm -hmm. Bradford again, I think. Mm -hmm. And Aki, who was a drummer. Uh, they're all from Bradford, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, they're all living in London, and maybe David Spat as well. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, they... But none of us looked like goths, actually. Buzz had really long hair down here on one side. Zodiac looked like a hell's angel. <laughs> And I look like, you know, tennis shorts. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But it's kind of worked, you know. But that, not, that it, it totally resonated with the northern vibe, I thought. 
Mm. I, th I think it's interesting that people manage to find the same answers to the same question in different places with, without knowing what you're doing. So you have the system of mercy and leads. Yeah. That's, I mean, there's a big argument there that the phone knows yeah. before. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Talk about the song before, yeah. you know, that, that guy there. And Futurama, of course. Which was amazing. Wasn't yeah. it? I mean, well, it was bleak. It was bleak, but it's amazing. He managed, he managed to pull off a festival in Leeds in, in yeah. that time. When, yeah. when there was no festivals in Britain, like yeah. now, was, every city That's has a festival. True. No one had done that. It was, it was, was visionary. John Keenan, yeah, yeah, yeah. John Keenan yeah. was the architect yeah. of the Leeds Post punk scene. You know, he created. Yeah. He lost a fortune on it all. You know, but yeah. he made it happen. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, and we managed to yeah, enjoy yeah, the yeah, 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 Sheffield all yeah. electronic music. It's, yeah. it's all. You think Cabaret Voltaire in Sheffield in 1974? Yeah. yeah. They can cutting up tapes yeah, and making that yeah, music. Amazing, yeah. Who would they think he was going to listen to it? I mean, it's yeah. I'm complete, I'm complete I'm yeah. all genesis, you know, PR is up in Hall, yeah. university. Yeah. yeah, and actually, at the same time, pretty much, she had Soft Cell, maybe a little bit later, the same time, the normal. Yeah. Same time as... Is 78, 79, right? Yeah, because he was DJing so, in the same club yeah. as well, so, where she is, but... Yeah. Th those, those, that's where we were bleeding to, you know, coming out of the rock scene into the Blitz, Blitz and Billy's. Billy's was a Bowie club, so Bowie was a big figure for, for a lot of those people. But also punk, it's weird because punk was quite innocent in many ways. Most of the people in punk were like in their late yeah. 20s. Um, uh, you know, I was 15, six, 16 in 1977, so, you know, there weren't that many kids my age around then. They're all a bit older. And they all had this kind of like, a little bit prudish attitude, like John Lydon going, I'd rather have a cup of tea than sex, you know. <laughs> it was more about sort of like a community and drugs and... But, weirdly enough, by the time it got to the back cave, it definitely had let its hair down. hair down a bit, and it's still very British, so it's still going to be a little prudish, mm. but it, was, it got a bit more like sexy and, mm. you know, a lot more girls were involved, a lot more girls in bands, and people would dress up, and, mm. you know, and then you go out, and then there was this whole S&M scene bleeding into it, and you go to Skin 2 afterwards, and which would be open a bit later. So things, again, on a more Dionysian, Bacchanalian level were kind of loosening up mm. and people were letting their hair down, yeah. And, and you liked that, of course. Well, who wouldn't? Yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 because I kind of didn't do that with punk, really. Were you kind of hoping punk was going to be like that and it was a bit too like the military? <laughs> well, you'd you think it would have been with all the sort of, the look, the look with the sort of PVC mini skirts ripped, um, you know, uh, nylon stockings and stuff. But that was actually a feminist statement against um, pervy city guys, you know. Yeah. So, so the, 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 those people weren't dressing up like that to be sexy. They were doing that as a political feminist statement. So, you, you, as a, being part of that, you wouldn't respond to that in that way. Mm. You know, um, it would be uncool to do that. Yeah, yeah. But um, whereas two, three years later, two, three years later, the goalposts have shifted a bit. So, yeah. Or have they? I think so. I think so because you know, punk descended into heroin and stuff very quickly in London with the heartbreakers turning up and stuff. Um, and yeah, I think you know, by the, with the back cave again, that was a bit more amphetamine fueled. Um, but again, with those sort of drugs, that can't actually taste the sting out of the sexual tail a bit. <laughs> so people just end up yapping all night long yeah. in someone's kitchen. Um, and again, and again, it's a little naive and innocent, which is which is endearing as well, you know. So you've got this kind of uh, sort of decadent side, which is great. So club scene, but at the same time, you're doing the spiritual search, aren't you? Know, so mm. how, one, how do you fit that in? And two, how did the two sort of combine? You know, so you, you're going towards even though you're taking the piss out of the, originally out of the, the magic side, mm. can enjoy, you'll get more interested in that and you're going towards the druidism as well. well you're, yeah. just, you're touching a spiritual side of yourself. Yeah. Was that the acid that started that? Was that just... <laughs> it was, yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. And definitely my bandmates got their revenge. Um, when, <laughs> before I actually had the meltdown, I was still tripping for about a month without taking anything. And I was going, look, if you... I, I had this thing where I was like, we can't whisper. <laughs> I, if we whisper, we'll be able to understand each other. <laughs> and I said, look, 
and we'd have a band meeting, and I was like, everybody's got a whisper. And we got to put our fingers in pyramids. And uh, if we really focus on something, it will happen. And I'd say, look, and they go, <laughs> and then I go, look outside that window. Let's focus the pyramids on that extreme light. And I guarantee in 10 seconds it will fly, flicker off. And we do it, and it would. And then, oh my god, you're fucking up! <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> um, and you know, some weird cosmic stuff was really happening. Um, but yeah, I was, I was in a very vulnerable, open, sort of naive place with it, which probably, you know, how I survived. I think my tarot card often when I do the tarot is the fool, you know, which is the zero card. And the fool is just sort of stumbles into things, and, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's, that's been my journey, really. Quite fitting for a band called Killing Joke as well, in a, in a I way. Yeah, yeah, I suppose so, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, what, what was it like to be in a hallucinogenic state in a band like Killing Joke? I mean, I, I actually find Killing Joke quite psychedelic, even the early re records, but were they quite dark sort of trips? Yeah. Well, you know, there was a big psychedelic scene at the time, Killing Joke was starting to blow up. And I go out to, to the gig and the big guy by the toilets and I'd be going, acid ash, acid ash. And loads of people would be buying acid. I've like, got people taking acid to us. <laughs> you ain't insane. <laughs> then you tried. But then I started doing it myself, actually. And I do. I did a whole German tour. And I had a girlfriend and she gave me a little quarter trip every night, like microdosing. Mm -hmm. Which... I think was very irresponsible because that led to my overall meltdown eventually. Um, but it certainly made the, the gig more fun and the light show better. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did it make the music? Did the music sound different to you when you were playing it, when you were tripping? Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, it is very psychedelic. Mm. I've, so tripped, I've tripped to it when I was yeah, there, but I wouldn't, stick, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. recommend it. For, unless you're a serious astronaut. But, hey, I mean, no, it's beautiful. I mean, there's some beautiful layers and tones within Killing Joe. You just wouldn't think of them as being a psychedelic band, but we were, actually. Very psychedelic. Yeah, and we'd have a lot of the Hawkwind crowd come and see us. And, uh, you know, we want to make it like that as well, because we were stoners, you know, we, we wanted it. We wanted people to get mm. a, a psychotropic experience from it, for sure. So how does that lead on to the, the more spiritual trips then, you know, where when you know you, you have your breakdown, you're trying to glue yourself back together, but was that like that these doors were opening all the time to like different experiences and different like mindsets? I, I was lucky in that I had two or three friends when I, when I got, you know, banged in the mental hospital, they come up every day. Um, one was Brian Barrett, who was Written a, written a book with Timothy Leary, it was considered the British Leary. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we had Dave the Wizard who blew fire at Killing Joe gigs. And he'd come up and he'd give me a crystal and go, you're not mad, just focus on the crystal. <laughs> you know, keep whispering. <laughs> <laughs> and he lived in our squat at the top of our house and he had the seven pointed star tattoo on his face, never wore shoes, had a stray dog called Heldon <laughs> and he had 18 stray cats and he'd always do a ritual, cast a circle in chalk on the, on the dance floor and blow fire at the gig and he had his own kind of weird druid, you know, sort of theology really. It, was, it wasn't anybody else's but it had a bit of this and a bit of that. And, and uh, he was a very, had a very big heart and he came and seen me, like every other day he'd turn up and we, you know, I was only in that hospital for two weeks and it was, what got me out was, I, you know, when you're mad, when you're having a psychotic experience like that, I was going, no, I'm not mad, you're mad. <laughs> You know, to everyone about everything, to my bank manager when I was burning money in his office, you know. And, uh, and he gave me this crystal once and he said, meditate on this tonight. And I, had a, I was up before a board of uh, doctors about whether they're going to section me. And in this meditation, these sort of spirit guides came to me. And there's, there's, some of those spirit guides are still with me today. And they said, look, when you go before this panel of doctors tomorrow, 
don't say you're mad and, and oh, I'm not mad. And <laughs> just say, I've had some LSD, I'm tired, I want to go home and see my mum. Yeah. And they'll let you go. <laughs> So that's why I didn't let me go. <laughs> that's a good tip. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> the next day we went up to Wales into a cottage and started trying and killing jokes there. <laughs> and Jazz would start brewing up a, you know, a cauldron of 500 mushrooms for everyone. Um, but actually I, actually, I stopped taking hallucinogens for a few years. I mean, why was that? Because you felt like you'd had enough? Because I just you got enough out of it. Had my ego well and truly shredded, you know. <laughs> and I'd come out of it. I mean, when I, when we went to Germany with Connie Plank to do something, I might look at my base, it's just a bit of wood with some metal on it. I'd be like, I don't know what that's about. And But, you know, it was only, if I think about it, it's only like seven years after that, I, went, I, I first went to Goa. Mm. And then, I, start, then I, I had a house in Goa for 10 years and I started taking LSD again. Mm. And, and, but with an informed, kind of a little bit more responsible attitude, although it's totally free there. And, you know, that, that was the birth of a whole other thing, psychedelic trance and everything. But, you know, it, it, that gap of six, six, seven years I had to try and like, rebuild my persona. I'd left the band. My second band had collapsed. I'd just begun producing with Alien Sex Fiend from, mm -hmm. from the back end. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, and I had to really begin a whole new journey. Um, You're quite a different person, though, when you get to go work. Or is it, is it just because a vibe ago is quite <coughs> different? You know, like, taking, I'm imagining taking Liz Genix in Killing Joke in that period of time, in a very sort of dark, you talk about the nuclear politics, it was a dark time really. Mm. Not a great time, I suppose, for a sense of young man to be taking lots of acid in the right place. Whereas in Goa, would there be, you know, could you perceive that as a bit more of a magical place, a bit more looser? Yeah, but a little more upriver, you know. Mm. So, you know, if you lost it there... Mm. You, you, you weren't going to get any advice to go see... It's going to be harder to get <laughs> back home. Um, you know, well, there's a few there. There's a few people from the sixties. Oh man, no. I go to this banyan tree by a lake in Arundel, and they had this uh, dear uh, Daychura Baba. There's this like Indian guru who had a few like acolytes around it, and they smoke these Daychura chillums, which Daychura is a very strong psychedelic. You know, you don't really come down from either. Mm. So uh, you, people will be warned about careful about accepting a chillum from that bubble or mm -hmm. and two of those guys in that tree with him were these uh, uh, Oxford academics who'd been there four or five years. In the tree? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, when are you going home then? I don't know, man. I lost my passport like five years ago. <laughs> we're here, we're, still, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> That's how far out people go in there, you know. But well, did you... Smoke the pipe? Then. No, I didn't. No, no, so you no. were smart enough then? Yeah, I was a little more discerning at that point because of what I'd been through. But it was that experience that actually brought me there. The, the experience of the meltdown on the King's Road was, you know, if I hadn't had that, I probably wouldn't have gone to Goa. And actually, it, a few years in Goa, then Ollie Wisdom turns up from the back end. Mm. And he'd been in Thailand for like five or six years. And he was a big DJ on that scene. Yeah, he started reinventing himself as a, a, a proto trance DJ, mm. you know. So, I mean, it was a, a weird set of serendipities that brought all of that together in India. But actually, if you think about Jim Morrison, Doors, you know, the whole thing, it makes a lot of sense. Mm. And actually, Go was this psychedelic community, quite lawless, where you could people could take acid all the time and not be... Um, hassled or bothered by it. I mean, was, I mean, was it was it just the party scene there, or were you getting into the into the art of darkness, but the Indian version as well? There's a, there's that kind of yeah. There's a spirituality to India. There's also that kind of dark sort of spirituality yeah, yeah. as well. And did that yeah. fascinate you? Yeah, I love a, I love a good cult. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so what kind of cults were you? Were? Oh, there were good cults in Goa. Yeah. There's this guy um, called the Bok, who had these uh, two little devil horns on his head. And he had an alternative history of the world, and uh, and it was this p totally pure LSD kind of psychology uh, spin, and history was his story. And you'd see his acolytes in sort of cafes around 
different villages gathering. There'd be 30 of them, and then the Bok would be talking. And they ended up trying to dig out this temple in Denmark. And I mean, a few of my friends, I mean, the guy put on some good pies. <laughs> but it was, it was a Saxon death cult. Like, again, I mean, there were a lot of rumours. Ollie was quite into it, actually. Mm. Um, and, yeah, I think... I, you know, I've got a, there's, I've got a few books. I've heard so many good stories from India at that time. There's a good movie around the Bok, I think. Mm. Um, I don't think it's around anymore, but uh, yeah, and there were other cults as well. So, so what is it about cults? The fact, just fascinating because it's an alternative way of yeah, thinking. Yeah. Or is it just because you're trying to find something? Well, what, what was great about India in that, in, that, in that time, you know, you have a lot of uh, what they call sannyasins, going, Westerners going to different gurus in India, Sai Baba, Osho, you go to the ashram. I mean, the first time I went to India, I did six months on my own going to all the ashrams. Mm -hmm. And I recommend it. It's a good way of finding out what, who you are, what you like, you know, what you don't like. What did you find? I didn't find the enlightenment I thought I was going to find. I, the best one I went to, although I'm still into some of those gurus, I quite like Osho, yeah. quite like a lot of them. But the best one was actually, I'd, I'd taken a wrong turn and I thought I was going to this ashram. I thought it was a, a, a Maharishi a TM one um, up near Benares. And, I'd gone the wrong turn, turned into what I realised later on was this leper colony. <laughs> <laughs> I know I know it. I know it's <laughs> by the monkey temple. It's close yeah. to the monkey temple, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there was this but the profound thing that happened to me there was there was a guy at the gate and he said, Yes, but what 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 what, what, what can we do for you? you know, and I said, Well, I'd like to come and you know, spend some time in the ashram. He's like, it's not an ashram. <laughs> and then I Look, and then I looked at him and I realised he didn't have any fingers or like half a hand and bits of foot. And, I, and he had this beautiful look, blue, actual azure blue eyes. Mm -hmm. And I thought, my God, this guy's got so much dignity. He's got way more dignity than I have. Mm -hmm. And I don't deserve to be here, you know. And uh, I, he said, you're very welcome to come. I ended up staying there a couple of days and then... Um, and then when I left, I, I, I got a really good lesson from that, of just, you know, gr mm. gratitude and, and how lucky can I be. And I, 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 you know what we're like in our 20s, oh, God, I've got a spot, oh, my God, <laughs> I can't go out. <laughs> uh, you know, it's pathetic, really. But and those are the experiences that like, brought me back to earth, I think. And, and then, so you'd have all these kids coming down at Christmas, which is the height of the season, um, you'd have all these kids coming down from the ashrams. They'd done six weeks, seven weeks, you know, right past the retreats, not talking to anyone. They'd come down to have a party in Goa at Christmas, and then Goa would be full of like, all these international drug dealers, and all these you know, people from Japan. You know, it was, it was a complete pirate, you know, kind of mashup of people. And, uh, and it was very under the radar, and people didn't... We, you, people would chuck your cameras away or break them if you brought, brought them out at a party. But it was a combination of a lot of those sannyasins wouldn't take drugs. Then there's all these other cats taking, kids taking buckets of drugs and people, parties would go on for two days. So, you know, it was an amazing uh, mixture of people um, and collision of, uh, of, of different things and stuff. And <coughs> of course with the music, even though it was a very generic, small bandwidth sound, you'd hear bits of Jim Morrison and, uh, and Timothy Leary. Hmm. Ollie had this one track called You Could Be Shiva, which, which would have Leary going, yeah, you could be Shiva, you could be Ganesh, you could be now. And I mean, if you're like, <laughs> off your absolutely flying on a liquid California LSD, and that's coming out four speakers, and you're like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm really cool. I am gonna Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that, the, those samples could really affect you. So, people were experimenting in different ways, and, but there was no real, you know, it was, a, it was a collaboration of tribes and people. It was, nobody was running it in any one way. Mm. Um, and some parties were kicking. And is this what you've been looking for in music? 
when you were a teenager. I, know, I was always looking for that. I miss uh, 60s Summer of Love. I would have loved to be been there for that. <laughs> but we had punk rock. And then just before Goa, we had Acid House, uh, yeah. which was pretty amazing. But I wasn't that into E, actually. And I was still a bit cautious about psychedelics. At that it doesn't point. sound like it. No. Yeah, but, but, <laughs> yeah. Later on, I mean, yeah, I was a bit, I, I, I was a little more cautious with go, in go with LSD, but I, I, these, I haven't taken LSD for 12 years. I still like mushrooms and some psychedelics, but LSD, I, I, yeah, I don't, I've really done it. Mm. So the mushroom is because it's more natural, you felt more comfortable with it? Well, I'm not necessarily. Sometimes the mushroom trips could be the darkest and the, the, the hardest, you know. But, but you would, would you embrace that darkness or would it be difficult or would it be something that was actually a good kind of lesson? We had a thing with my friends at the party was if we were doing like a lot of parties, like three parties a week, we would delegate one of us to be the responsible adult and they wouldn't take acid and they would make sure everyone was sorted out and get you a cup of tea or gin and tonic, anything you want. And, you know, that'd be a 10 hour gig. But when it was my turn to do that, I really enjoyed it because mm. I like looking after people. Mm. And I'm pretty good at it as well. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I, but it was just, that, that was another level of responsibility that I hadn't seen anywhere else. Was, you, you had someone in your corner looking out for you. Mm. And that really helped you get through the night. Ideally today, it's the ayahuasca phenomena and you'd have a, a proper shaman and they navigate you through your shadow uh, and help you bring up those dark corners in a, in a, in a gentle, responsible way. Um, you know, a rave on a beach in Goa is, is going to be a whole other experience, but it will bring up a lot of stuff, you know. It's interesting you mention shaman, of course Jim Morris is interested in the shaman, yeah. there's songs of poetry about it, but you can see that in a lot of the music we talk about in this book as well, especially yeah. in Killing Joke, obviously yeah. your singer does have a, a shamanistic kind of tendency or kind of yeah. feel on stage, but not just him, the whole band, and it? it's it's yeah. different, isn't it? It's, it's, a, it's a rock and roll group, of course, but there's something yeah. quite different about what you do, and is that conscious to sort of, sort of go into those areas live? <sighs> yeah, I think some of it is, yeah, totally, yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. know, to take people on a trip, yeah, it's, I mean, it's great, you could dance to a yeah. joke, great, but it's, yeah. it's somewhere else, isn't it? But also the way the songs are written musically and with the lyrics, um, Paul and Jazz will be doing the lyrics and they'll, they, they kind of work on a ceremonial level. They're not about, you know, going out to see a gig at the weekend or something. Yeah. They, they do go, go into the, the deeper recesses of our psyches and personalities. I think for Jazz, you know, he'd had such a difficult childhood. You know, it was a way of expressing all of that confusion and and, and, and the, his anger at the hypocrisy of society. He could do that very eloquently through the lyrics of Killing Joke, and we can all relate to it, you know. You know that's very shamanic. I mean, well, um, what do you want people to achieve from going to the Killing Joke gig? I mean, of course, all different things, you know, just have a good time, dance, or to actually, in the words of Jim Morrison, to break on through to the other side. Is that something, is that the ultimate aim? Our aims are towards what we want to get out of it personally, first and foremost. Which is? Well, that can be different things. We always do a little ceremony before we go on stage and mm -hmm. ask for the blessing of the spirit at that time and place. And those, those questions might be a personal or more universal thing. Um, but it changes. Um, and... I think that's part of our process, um, but again, you know, I come, you know, I come from Druidry and, you know, shamanic native traditions. Jazz and Paul and Geordie kind of more of the Western magical traditions. In the Western magical tradition, like Freemasonry, magical orders, it's really about, um, summoning and commanding these legions of angels and demons and getting them to do your will, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, now, as opposed to the shamanic traditions, it'll be more about doing ceremonies and rituals that help you connect to that time and place within the wheel of the seasonal circle. And it will be about getting the blessing of the spirits and the ancestors that, you've, that are there uh, and, and getting them to guide you through what you're going to do, rather than using a will. It's, it was a 
you know, different different process. Do you mean touch the force and power of nature in a way? Or a spatial thing, or both? Yeah, I mean, it, that, the, the sort of Wicker Druid thing is more about thinking into the nature. It's the idea that it's already perfect as it is, and sometimes we can go blind to that, you know, and, and yeah. open our eyes, increase our awareness and, and appreciation of that. Whereas, you know, the, the, the more Western magical tradition is more about like, Give me gold from that, <laughs> the alchemists. And yeah, like yeah. That. Although that again could be tr interpreted in different ways, but you know, so I think to these days we're more leaning towards a shamanic idea of what we're doing ceremonially, rather than you know specific invocating uh, invo invocations of, of something. Oh, so that they're coming to your side of the stage. I, not just mine, but I think we're all leaning towards that a bit. Paul's leaning towards Tibetan Buddhism a bit more. Jazz is interested in lots of things, you know, from um, Sufism to Tibetan Buddhism. And, but he's they're, they're still into that stuff. Jordi's into his Gometria and all that. And but you know, that's I think when we're together, then it makes it's a kind of a it's a safer place to go. Mm. When you're we asking for the blessings, or you, rather than you commanding something, you know, mm. it's a different uh, part of the ego you're using, you know. So, I think um, we we find, we I find that more comfortable. I mean, obviously they have their own private practices, and you know, I don't know what Chaz is up to when he's doing that, <laughs> but um, I I think it's leaning towards that as well. We we kind of in sync with that very much, I think. And do you see, like, with Druidism, that's like a, a British shamanism, is that, or, or is it different? Or, or Druidry, is Druidism, yeah. Druidry is a, a native, indigenous uh, tradition, shamanic traditions of these islands, as is Wicca. Mm -hmm. um, and they go very closely hand in hand. And what, is your fascination with that because you happen to live here? Or is it just something, it wouldn't matter where you live, they're, they're the closest to what you kind of feel? Well, you know, ironically, it was when I first went to India and I was doing the ashrams, I had this thing of, like, I could do maybe a seven week retreat, I could do a three year retreat. I, I, I've got that in me to do that. And I was doing a retreat, and in that retreat I was thinking about doing a, one in Nepal that was going to go on for a few years. And I had a very profound meditation in that, and what came out of that was that well, my path wasn't in India, but back here on, in these islands. And I thought, wow, that's weird. I've come all the way to India to be told to go back again. <laughs> yeah. and, but as soon as I came back, through a series of serendipities, I got, um, I joined a Druid, a Druid order. This was about 88, 89. Mm -hmm. And that began my, a serious mystery school education um, towards, you know, what that is. And, uh, you know, that, that was where my path led. Mm. Um, and how much that changed you as a person? Oh, irrevocably, you know. I mean, I could. Did you finally feel like you were at home in a way? Oh, Literally, totally. geographically, yeah, spiritually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and all my, also my father's family are from Innesmon Anglesey in Wales, which is a home of the Druids. I've just been. You've just been up there, and hey, I've just done some poetry performances there. Uh, and was that, was that like a very connecting trip being up there? It was amazing because uh, I had my family there, mm -hmm. and we had serendipitously, there were some other Druids from other orders. So, allowed me to go into these locked chambers and do some ceremonies in there and then I'd be performing on stage uh, five gigs in a row all with a different band every night people I hadn't met from harpists to guitarists um, some of them I had but a lot of them I hadn't and so it was really like the Damo Suzuki counting and just get up there and do it and do it with the poetry I had people in tears every night and, and coming up to me really moved and for me to reconnect to my own poetry in the place of my ancestors physically and metaphorically was mind-blowing. I mean, two weeks earlier, I'd been doing the Albert Hall with Killing Joe. Yeah, yeah. But that 60 people in that little chapel in Hollyhead oh, was just mind-blowing. And, and so, yeah, I mean, that's... I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you if I hadn't do, have done that. Um, and I think it's important to find your... Um, your, the expression of your spiritual self, you know. I mean, I think it, it, it's easy to think you don't need that, 
but without it, I don't know how you're going to find any kind of meaning or purpose to what you do. What that gave me was a lot of meaning and purpose to what I did and what I'd done. And that put it into a context of, okay, this is, and then what, what's your job? Inspire people to do the same. You know, so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been hugely important. Nevertheless, I'm not evangelical about it. I'm like, don't join, you know, join or don't join. Do your thing, do whatever you want. Um, but you, I think to find that sense of completeness, sense of self, who you are, where you are, what you're doing, context of that, meaning and purpose to it, you've got to find uh, a spiritual connection. Do, do, do you have a spiritual connection? Or are you... I'm, I'm more on the nature side, I am too. Right. Well, that's very true. Yeah, that's yeah. Very I've, I've done a Druid yeah. ceremony. Yeah. Yeah, in the Bow Tower yeah. of London. Okay. I think it was your Druid gang, but you were there that day. Oh. <laughs> it was about cool. six years ago. Wow. Yeah. So I went to the uh Matt, he actually knows you, but, uh, yeah. but they wrote me in so to hold up the thing with you yeah. down at the end of the uh, fascinating day out actually. Oh incredible. Yeah. I mean I don't, we to the order I'm involved with, we would do ceremonies, they still do them on the solstice on Glastonbury tour and yeah. there'd be five hundred people doing a ceremony on top of the tour mm. just before sun. I mean just mind blowing. This was about two hundred people by yeah. the Tower of London. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? So, I got a theory that as soon as you form a circle with even three people for you, you create that universal portal, the, the, the interdimensional gateway that will go beyond where you actually physically are and things. Do you, you not feel completely tuned in to, to the violence and the beauty of nature just by being in nature? I think so, yeah. I don't think you need... You don't need the circle or the ceremony. No, you, no, you don't. You don't, you don't necessarily need anything. No. But because we live in a very difficult societal controlled world without a structure like a ceremony or to, to break break on through again basically yeah, it, it, yeah it's going to be hard to do that on your own and i think when you when you do it with a a, a covenant or an order um, you've got the strength of all of that and all that legacy that goes with that to help help you kind of get through it and understand what it is what well, was I found interesting when I was writing the book about a lot of the bands. A lot of people do sing and talk about spirituality, whether they really anti-God and anti-spiritual, which is actually a powerful spiritual feeling in a sense, isn't it? Or people like, like say, you on your spiritual yeah. quest, or also yeah. like Nick Cave, who's ended up yeah. being, uh, you know, a Christian, isn't he? You know, so these are all spiritual trips, mm. and probably more than any other music scene that I've ever looked at. You know, it's everybody's kind of got at least one song trying to deal with the spiritual quest yeah. in that period of time and I find that quite fascinating was was that something that people talked about was something that was felt or was it something that was there in that period no, I don't think it was overtly dis discussed you know it was there was too much speed and <laughs> you know sort of crazy rock and roll going on but I think subliminally that was what was driving us all really. was it because Punk asked a lot of questions and everyone's trying to find some kind of answer in the confusion the problem with Punk as much as I love Punk was that it was a reactionary movement so once you took the, the problem away you weren't left with a philosophy yeah. other than that Smashed down the wall, yeah. <laughs> which is great. Yeah. yeah. So, so what, what came in with post-punk um, was I, I, uh, rather than like a an anarchist smashing down the walls, it was more like a uh, you know the, this is the influence of Joy Division, I think, and uh, the French poets, the Romantics, which which was more of an introspective look into the self and an authentic look into the self and existential look of how we cope with living and the imminent arrival of death eventually and how to marry that out with creativity yeah. um, and art, you know. Is it marrying it or is, or is the creativity the kind of the quest or, or part of the journey? Or? Yeah, it's chicken and egg, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, yeah. Yeah. Trying to work out which way around it. Yeah, I think, I think it, it, you know, the art, the, the stories, the, the first books, you know, there's there's an element like all the, the even the vampires, all that. There's a sexual undercurrent to it all as well. So 
Well, if you're in a situation where you're in a very sexually repressed society, like the UK in the late 70s, then those sort of, those books like that just give your imagination wings and, and, and can somehow, you can dream those, those beautiful experiences even if they're not proposed. And if you're in a club and everybody's wearing black and you're listening to, you know, um, Ian Asprey go on about something, that can somehow help a little bit towards helping you find that in your own way, you know, even though it's not going to be explicitly put in front of you on a silver plate, you might then go on to explore other things. Uh, so, so partially the role of an artist is to open the doors, apart from just playing bass and producing loads of records, or they, is that the way of opening the doors, in a way, or, or exploring, or... That's a lot of questions in that one sentence. Mm -hmm. The role of the artist. I think if you really look at the role of the artist, you go back to... Um, the shamans again. All the all the arts go back to ceremony and ritual, and uh, those were the first artistic expressions. You know, and whether it's in Delphi and ancient Greece or uh, Druid rites in Stonehenge five thousand years ago, the 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 visionary oracular nature of the poetry and the shamans that those these things. Even though it looks like we're in the 21st century here, those things are just a tiny bit below a very thin veneer. Mm. And they're still very much there. You still very much hear it in the... When we look back now, and we can discuss Jim Morrison and Ian Curtis and their lyrics and what they... Of course that's what they were talking about. Mm. And it's the same stuff, you know. And, it, and, and those are our community teachers of the day, you know, who, by just expressing their own experience, help to facilitate our own. You know, and give us the confidence to do the same, and uh, and that's been a very important role of those poets and, and and shamans. It's part of one of the themes I was trying to do in the book. You know, that every generation is trying to deal with his blues or whatever in yeah. different ways. So, yeah. in the nineteenth century, it would be the poets, it would be the mm. painters, and mm. in the late seventies, early eighties, because yeah. music culture was the number one culture, yeah. it? and that's the place you would express it. Now it's probably on the social media, so it just changes with whatever the creative technology is. But the feeling always stays there, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe social media, but that's just a that's just a platform. It's not anything in itself, is it? If you drop ideas into it, it can open mm. doors, I suppose, can't it? Not as Absolutely. obviously not as powerful as a high decibel gig, yeah, which yeah. is a very yeah. sh shamanistic yeah. sort of ritualistic yeah. sort of thing. That's pretty obvious what that's saying, isn't it? But that's often where kids find their tribe now, like, is through people on social media and people on niche. Experience. I mean, were you always trying to find your tribe? Because I'm feeling you're probably a tribe of one, aren't you? Yeah, well, that was the thing, you know, we thought, you know, we'd never be in a club that would have us, that sort of thing. You know? so we, we find our tribe, but then we say, no, we don't want a tribe. <laughs> we want to be on our own. <laughs> so it constantly... But it, of course, all those subcultures, it's all about community, it's about building community, finding community, breaking down communities, creating new ones, creating a reality that, you know, is fits the way you want to live your life. I mean, that's, that's what it's really all about. Or is it trying to smash down the reality in punk style, but trying to get beyond that mm. to... to to a, to a truth or your truth, is that what the whole quest was? Well, I think you, it, you, yeah. you, often, especially with post-punk, to destroy, to create was very, very, it seemed like a very good philosophy and it, it didn't just come from the goths, I mean, that was, that was a thesis of Dub, you know, and, uh, and Lee Perry and, and all that, so the idea of breaking down those sacred cow walls, you know, that was a big part of punk. Post-punk was being yourself, doing it the way you wanted to do it without anybody else's approval. Mm. That's why I think that's like more powerful today because that's a message you know young people always need to hear. Mm. Um, do you think everything's got to, we're almost back to the beginning now, but more Apollonian and less Dionysian? But it's certainly more conservative, isn't it? And I think yeah, if you look at the the populist agenda of the last five, ten years, the way the world's going, politicians banding uh, nuclear 
war threats around again. Seriously, I mean, that that you know that some um, that 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 needs uh, to be taken on mm. with it by artists um, and addressed mm. and, uh, and and vigorously, I think. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny how you would talk about the people tripping in a room and it had to be some one person who's like the grown up in the room and it's ironic that the, the politicians have become the children in the room and you become the grown up, it's, <laughs> it's upside down. I, I never could have believed anyone 30 years ago telling me that we would have the politicians we have in power now and just how irresponsible and uh, without any humanity, how self-serving they've become um, and how much they undermine our own integrity with their uh, absolute blatant lies um, and they expect us to just eat it up and, and it's shocking we do somehow but sometimes we don't and I think the point of community and stuff like that is to give us an inform us of of what we have to do individually and as a community to resist that uh, uh, you know big government or even small government um, propaganda machine and and create an alternative um, that has meaning and an authenticity and is based in basic humanity and simple human principles. Yeah, nice place to end that. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? Any questions to floor? Um, start here. Yeah. Hello. You'll have to shout because I don't think the mic will reach. So I, can... um, I, I brought it with me just so you might amuse you. Um, my enemy reader's poll thing that I filled in in 1980 and never sent off. Um, the wrong one. You, you, you got the best haircut, best band, killing joke, but I, was, I can remember filling it in, trying to be a bit varied. It would have been best drummer, Paul Ferguson, but I didn't know his name. <laughs> I only knew you were that. Anyway, yeah, you've got best haircut, best killing job. I've got it with me, actually. I was hoping you might have a look. Like you can it. send it in now. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's probably what I don't, know if you won. I don't know if you won or not, but I've got it here with Did me. Did you win best haircut in 1979? <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it. I mean, I, yeah, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't even consider it. <laughs> a bit trivial, sorry. But yeah, I, was only, but, I was only 15. No, I'll take it as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. You used to look like Sid Vicious on acid. That was your kind of look. Wow, the Sid Vicious thing came because I just prior to Killing Joe, I had a band with John Lydon's brother, Jimmy, 4B2, and we made a couple of records, one of the lads, still a fantastic record. And, you know, uh, and the idea then was a mar was, was like a, a marketing thing to get the band a deal, was the manager was like, look, we got Jimmy, he, he, you look like Sid, pretend you're Sid's brother, we'll get a deal. And we, and we actually did get a deal with Highland Records on the back of that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, but then, it, you know, it took me a while to shake that off, you know. But it was worth it, you know, it's a really good experience. And I, I actually love Sid, I never met Sid. Uh, I never saw the Pistols live properly, um, but I love the Pistols, you know. And, and of course, Pill, which is... And Pill, you know, was even better in a way. Um, but I think a really big influence on a lot of... What oh, huge. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. it's the darkness and the space yeah, and the music yeah, and the mixture yeah. of dog and disco yeah, and everything. Yeah, yeah, the whole can element of, mm. of that. Well, you used, you used to go to Gunter Grove where John Lydon lived, didn't you? Yeah, I was hanging out there um, because I've been in the band with Jimmy and I live around the corner in Oz Court. I became friends with John. He was he was very warm and kind. And and I, 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 I'd just sit and hang out in his living room and he'd have Don Letts, Vivian Goldman, coming through and slits and I, I, they're all a lot older than me, you know, and I'd just be quiet in the corner rolling a joint and just taking notes really. And, uh, but I mean, when I look back now, it's just a matter. Huge, huge experience for me at the time. Oh, no, that, was, that, that was the epicenter, I imagine. Yeah, and that vibe I remember, you know, distinctly. And, you know, that's... You know, a lot of things about being in a studio with bands and artists, it's just a vibe, it's not something you can, 
it's that Dionysus. He can't specifically, rationally describe what it is, but it's a feeling, and it can take a while to develop a sensibility for those feelings. But that's what I've really done in many ways. As a producer, and just as a, a cat who's trying to learn what it's about, you know, I I lost it with LSD because I thought I was too normal that I'd never lose it. I said, there's no way I'm going to go to where Jim went on those kinds of because I'm just too straight and normal. Mm -hmm. And uh, that made me cavalier. And then when I did get there, I was like, whoa, actually, yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it, all of that was just to help find out who I was, really, who I am, you know. Okay, there's a question there. Over here, oh. Oh, no. All right, okay. <laughs> hey, is that Leslie? Yeah. Yes, yeah. I'm Right. You'll come to you in a minute. We'll go to Leslie first. Yeah. No. 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 Leslie first, because we'll, we'll, women first. Then we'll come to you. Yeah. Yeah. You tell That's them. Why sexy. did you write the book? Hey. That's good. Why one. did you write the book? Yeah. Well, because because I wanted to. I, I, I thought it was a scene that was very misunderstood, and I, th I thought a lot of the music in the book wasn't taken seriously enough. I think bands like Bauhaus used to get awful, terrible press when they came out. And to me, they're one of the greatest art rock bands this country's ever produced, and I wanted to celebrate that, really. And I wanted to contextualise it. I want to try and explain what it was. And it, and there's such a cliched idea what goth was. And it's like all, it's like punk as well, and everything just gets really reducted into a simple cliche. But they're actually much more fascinating and layered and nuanced. Oh, down. Oh, true. <laughs> so, so that was the answer. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's a very good answer as well. Yeah, and let, let's let's give it up for John. Yeah. Uh, that's what we're all here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Your question now. Yeah. Yep. Uh, what was the band? That, was it brilliant that you said was the second band you had? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And which which had Jimmy Corti and Ben Watkins. Yeah, it was a, it was an interesting band. It was decent, really mm. decent. It was it, it was definitely I think it was a stepping stone to something that went next, wasn't it? It was it, it, it never resolved into a full thing, did it? It was an experimental lab, really, for me, um, and it was a lot of fun. And you know, with any lab experiment, you're gonna go, you know, not everything's gonna work out the way you want. But what it really led to was. Uh, it really, really helped me learn how to produce records and, uh, and and work with different artists. And I think really what came out of it straight away was KLF and the Orb, you know. Mm -hmm. So those those two things in themselves made a lot of sense of it. And it's just one of those weird things that it's what was around it, what came out of it that made sense of it rather than it itself. But the records I'm proud of. I mean, they're, they're experimental, they're different, but they're... they're they're great, you know, that's, that was part of the spirit of the time. Maybe, well, maybe one like, day you could finish it. It was part psychedelic really, wasn't it? I think so, yeah, we were very inspired by, you know, psychedelia from Hendrix onwards. I remember us doing a, a cover of uh, Purple Haze at Brixton Rock Against Racism mm. that went on for about 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> in, in a Purple Haze? Yeah. <laughs> It only worked because we didn't have a guitarist, I think. So it was the two basses yeah, doing yeah. the first. <laughs> yeah, it was great. And, uh, you know, I didn't know what we were trying to work in toward, towards. But again, it, I kind of keeps coming back to that idea as a community. Came out of oh, a lot of us were living in squats at the time and, and diverse people coming together. Um, to just see what you, you could do. Mm -hmm. Which is great, he's been about it. Mm. Yeah. yeah. This is directed at both of you, but first of all, you. You may remember me from Bastard Union. Anyway, I was wondering what poetry work trends do you have Gosh. in the pipeline? Because I know it's wonderful to see things online. I love to hold a real book. So I'm wondering if you have any new. And also, John, I was wondering, do you believe that poetry still has value, or is it a bit of a dying art that people only ever felt they had to read because they were taught it in school? Poetry. I think um, the power of the word is everything, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be in poetry, it could just be when you're talking and speaking. It's like I actually taught myself archaic old English language. And you should be up here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and 
you know, add to my work because I feel things can become repetitive and boring. And I like to, I, th I think so many things should be got back because they're beautiful, they're powerful, and to have a, an elegance so that seems to have been diluted and lost. Mm. I, th I think you've almost, you've kind of answered the question in the question. <laughs> but there, there is an answer actually because she's asking me if you've got a book. Well, he has brought a book of poetry and it's, yeah. it's with my books uh, on the way out yeah. sort of thing, isn't it? So you'll be signing yeah. them after. I will. So, I, yeah. There's only a last few left from the Welsh tour I did, so there's only about ten, but... Slaves of Venus. I, I'd say, yeah, uh, the, 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 the written word, poetry, what I love about it is the limitations that come with it. There's, coming from being a record producer where I can put 200 tracks together to create this incredible world, to just let us on a page, you know, it's a very stark, basic medium really I mean how do you find that compared to making music yourself well I write lyrics and I, I love yeah. it's my favourite part yeah. and I yeah. love the sound of words mm. and the textures of words but I often wonder if anybody else gives a fuck about them <laughs> 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 but, that, but again that doesn't really matter does it because it's, yeah. it's for you isn't it I think so you should be yeah but the, the sound the rhythm I actually prefer the spoke word or the sound of words to the written words I think mm. When you hear things the way people talk, so when when oh, yeah. she was asking the question, her accent, yeah, her beautiful, accent yeah. was completely uh, intriguing. You know, a lot yeah. of accents and the way people yeah. talk and twist words round, yeah. stuff like that. They become melodic, especially in Ireland and Wales. And uh, well, that's the thing, you know, when yeah. people tell people they can't sing, it's ridiculous because everyone could talk. Yeah, everyone could talk. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Your voice is melodic, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, but there's something about the written word I love as well. And, yeah. And be able to, you know, to have a book of poetry. It's it's like a, a little flash of bird song can just suddenly transpose and transform your mood instantly. And if you're on a train or a bus and you just look at one line of poet that talks to you, I mean, that can have a similar effect. It's, it's interesting because another thing that runs through the book is is the sensuality, the sensuality of, of Goth as well. With yeah. every sense. Yeah. was covered, wasn't it? And so yeah. we talked about that yeah. there, you know, yeah. the sound of poetry, yeah. Yeah. the visual impact of poetry, the yeah. sound of the music, yeah. all those things. But I think I would argue probably more than any of the other musical genre, it's the most, probably the most sensual in a sense. But yeah, and I think romantic as well. In, 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 I mean, people think, okay, you know, the, you've got Sisters of Mercy, and then, but then you look at Kate Bush, Hounds of Love, that's totally Byron-esque, uh, you know, even Wuthering Heights, totally Dionysian, um, Gothic-inspired music. It just doesn't sound like the Sisters of Mercy, but <laughs> actually what, what she's talking about is very similar to some of the other artists. That we've you know, I, I put her in the book even though she's not, you know, she's not, as you say, goth. But yeah. that's, that's putting boundaries up to yeah. the irritating. Yeah. But she is covering the same. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and probably more. Yeah. Sensual way as yeah. well, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And of course Bowie was doing the same thing before God. Well, he's a precursor, and he, yeah, if it's yeah. Jim Morrison, then Bowie the yeah. Goth. And there you go. It's, yeah. it's a very simplified yeah. route, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. 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 So, any more questions? Yeah, well, you've had your question, Leslie. So, you yeah. You've had your question. Yeah. 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 I'd like a question to you both. In the old days, we're days, here there afterwards. <laughs> yeah. There was a, in the old days, there was all these different factions you could join up with. Uh, it was like part of your identity, part yeah. of your youth. Now there's fuck all. Can you tell me why you think that is? Well, like, well you have goths and skins and teds and... Um, now everybody's everything, aren't they? But actually, it is the age of the niche now, so if you want to be a cookie monster <laughs> you know, thing, you can find your tribe out there somewhere, they're there. Um, but I think culturally... Yeah, I, it doesn't. It doesn't work the same way, like as a uniform. But I, every band, young band I work with, or my kids' mates who are doing bands, I'm like, find a dead pub on a Monday night and start your own night and create a scene and build a community. Because without that, you got nothing. You know, you, that's what it's all about. And and you for those people as soon as you have the courage to put yourself out there, those people come. And 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 that hasn't changed. That's always the same as it's ever been and uh, always will be. And it is it comes back to the same they are out there. They may not be all wearing the same look anymore, but 
the, the, the passions are there and they, you will find them. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it. Yeah. In fact, why, why attract yourself in a genre? You know. Well, there's that as well. And, and the irony is, like with teenagers, you know, you, you, you break, you, you, you have to destroy your parental identity with one that you think's your own. And they used to be like heavy metal or Iron Maiden or Killing Joke T-shirt or whatever. It would be somebody else's identity that you would take yeah. on to find your own in a weird way. And there's a lot of paradox in that, but I think that is part of the process. Kids are a bit more knowing now, so they're not like so ready to invest in somebody else's trip. And that's maybe not such a bad thing. Mm. And also, I think because there's so much available, that you could, it's because it was always a bricolage culture, everything was chopped up, but now it's there are 10 things being caught up, it's about 100,000, isn't it? So, like you yeah. say, you can be a cookie monster with a. But and like, well, you were actually a problem, weren't you, with your. Yeah. With your punk trousers yeah. and your teddy boy top, yeah. so that was a very primitive version we could be now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, question. Uh, so, John, we saw you probably five years ago. You did a talk with Andy Sex Gang and Rosie from March Violence. You were talking Woo. about writing a book. Got really excited. It's taken ah. you a little while. Yeah. No Too longer than that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, interestingly, the, uh, we've got Kathy Unsworth coming out. Uh, him from the Cure's got one. Were you waiting for the time where the clouds are lining? And is it that Goff's got its moment? Is it next for Pop Will Eat Self and Carter and Wonder Stuff? Was <laughs> <laughs> it the timing and what time No, I, I actually just managed to finally finish the book. It took me all that time. Finished the edit. Got ready to put it out, and suddenly there's two other books. I mean, that's, I guess that's just life, isn't it? Actually, I could have finished it two years ago, and I wish I had, but. Like life gets in the way, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. So that, that's what happened. So it's all a coincidence. <laughs> it's coincidence because I think because any kind of culture that's a strong culture, that any time you put a spotlight on it, it's also always there anyway. So if this had come out two, three years ago, it would have been the same level of interest in it, maybe because it was already there in a sense, you know. So I don't think it's, it's got just because of Wednesday it doesn't suddenly get a high water mark. It's, it's, it's just there anyway, isn't it? So. It, it would have happened, but I wish it had been quicker. You know? yeah. What question? Me? Yeah, so um, I, I'm really interested in like, the way the asset, and my youth and John, by the way, uh, um, uh, the asset current has uh, presented itself there because it suddenly strikes me uh, that um, golf is a kind of like post facto psychedelia. Mm. And it's a dark psychedelia, mm. like mm. in the kind of post industrial. On, and that kind of really hit me, and it suddenly struck me in my own life that I've had two kind of moments like that. The first time I took acid, and as you, you were kind of talking about your acid experience and how it opened your mind, I saw um, The Cure uh, at, in Glastonbury in 1986, and I took a white line at this sort of very <laughs> opening experience of two wonderful on either side of the pyramid stage, again, bringing out the crowd in, the metric order, the golden dawn connection, and all that. The following day, I was given my second acid trip by Andy, who was a big Sisters of Mercy fan, who introduced me to the earlier Sisters of Mercy EP for the Comfort of Emma, who then went on to do the lights for The Cure and many other bands as well, be a bit of a star of variety, be a white society man and all that. So there is a huge current connection between psychedelia and as you, you were right upon the outgoer and all the kind of other shamanic conditions Mm. and golf, which may be in the way that it's been mediated, has been obscured. I wrote about it in the book actually, you know, like say The Cure's Pornography is an incredibly psychedelic record, but it's not Paisley Pattern. Yeah. It's just, it's monochromatic psychedelia, isn't it? Yeah. But I'm all the more powerful for it. A good, a good, often overlooked uh, element of goth, I think generally, is David Tibet. I don't know if he's in the book, so I've not read yes. it. But yeah. Yeah. Again, like I was saying about that traditional psychedelic folk music, that's that was the direction he went in with current ninety three and and really to really owned it now. I mean and he brought Shirley Collins back recently and responsible for some book. huge yeah. things, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um as well as going through all of his stuff with um Psychotic. It's quite amazing the stuff he's done actually. Yeah, it is. You're busy. <laughs> yeah, I actually played on the first current 93 album, I think, went in 98, 1, 82. Yeah. Um, and we've remained friends ever since. But 
Yeah, I, I, he's 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 a great source of inspiration, I think, and and has retained, a, you know, a continuity and yet changed completely as he's developed as well. You know, amazing. So in a sense, yeah, he probably was a second psychedelic age, but um, a darker one. <laughs> yeah. So uh, one more question, but it has to be a different person. Just give people a turn. So, oh, well, we'll have two. So I'll come back to you. Do, in the corner, in the corner, yeah. Hi, yeah, sorry. Uh, is there something in the water in the north? Dark times, dark culture. I have to ask, I'm a northerner. You know. Yeah, well, 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 you know there is. Yeah, there's always something different in the water in the north. I think, well, I, I, I probably might talk about that before, but the idea that it was independent, wasn't it? People, people were actually doing stuff outside the, the capital city narrative, weren't they? You know, they were doing stuff not dictated by the music business. That, that's one of the reasons why Goff got slagged off a lot because it, what, the music papers couldn't control it. It was out of it, people doing it anyway, weren't they? And I got really fascinated by these people working in isolation, like Bauhaus, like say Sisters in Leeds. You know, I know Leeds is a really big city now, but then it, these northern cities and Manchester felt like sort of they, did, they weren't backwaters, but they felt like backwaters. But when you think stuff like Joy Vision came out of Manchester or the Bunny Men coming out of Liverpool and people's reactions to punk and going off and misinterpreting punk and coming out with their own answers. Because there was nothing else around that could actually sort of influence them, was there? You know, they were, they were working in isolation. I think that was important. And I think people also, to, to be that defiant, to be into a, a culture you could get beaten up for by dressing up, which I wrote about in the book, you know, like, you, as you know, coming from the north, it could get a bit rough sometimes if you didn't dress like everybody else. And you think of people like Pete Burns going around Liverpool in the 70s, <laughs> looking absolutely amazing, you know. And when, when people would shout stuff at me, you'd just stop in the street, look at them, they would run off. Because he was not camp at all, was he? He was pretty hard and he could, he could take that shit. I think that those people are amazing. I think those people definitely sparked the culture in all those towns, you know, and the people went with them. So I think that sense of isolation was important because you could fester away without anybody sort of influencing you. And I think that was really important. But it's a very different experience when you're in London, isn't it? Or, or did it kind of feel like that as yeah. well? Yeah, well, that's right. I mean... You know, Manchester was actually the centre of trade, wasn't it, for hundreds of years? You know, I went all over the world um, with cotton, and, and 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 you know, the government may have been in London, but there wasn't much industry in that way. And we were a lot, you know, we're southern softies, you know, compared to the hard-working northern, you know, things. So I don't know. I, it's. I think the weight of those the mills, the dark satanic mills and all that, all those red brick mill buildings in Salford and stuff, you'd be like, oh, that looks dark and heavy, you know. And you, there was a, a feeling of like, well, you know, embracing that almost emotionally, but also transcending it with their art and, and music. Which... So when, when you tour the Joy Division, mm. how did, culturally did it feel very different? Do you think... Did they feel very northern, you felt very southern, or did it just not matter at all? No, no I mean, like, Joy Division were very sophisticated. Mm. I mean, Ian Curtis. Well, Ian was, but uh, Hookie's... Yeah, the other was, but... <laughs> it, it was, it was Ian's band, really, wasn't it? And, and, and where he was coming from intellectually, you know, um, was way beyond us all the, road, all, all the rest of Joy Division, you know, he, he was, he really understood the art of it and it was, it was a lot, a much more sophisticated uh, mm -hmm. thing, I think there was a Doors element to that as well. For him, definitely, yeah. I, I, I mean, Hooky, yeah. I don't think, he, I, I, I believe me, he said he never heard the Doors and yeah. he had played record and thought, yeah. Hooky always said, fuck me, we do sound yeah. the Doors. <laughs> yeah. But, I think what's fascinating about people like, like say, Hooky yeah. is that, he, his bass lines are incredibly sophisticated, oh, yeah. but he had no idea yeah. where he came from, yeah. and I love that. I think yeah. that intuitive well, brilliance yeah. is something, I mean, isn't it? For all of us, I mean, some of the best records I ever made are made before I was 20, and I didn't know anything then. So there's a lot to be said for not knowing what you do. But uh, you, you still need someone in that circle that does, and I think you need an Ian Curtis who's yeah. turning you on to Herzog movies and making you listen to Iggy Pop so you you know, things like, you need, we all need mentors to turn us on to stuff. And Ian was very much, um, a, you know, a very, you know, a, a good mentor in that way for the other members of the band. And probably on his own before the band. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, is that picture of the Mont de Marsan festival in France, 
in 1975 with a cluster t-shirt on. Yeah. One, cluster were pretty obscure, yeah. and two, yeah. there weren't very many band t-shirts yeah, in 1975, yeah. That's was right. it? That's right, that's right. You look at that picture and you think, yeah. wow, he looks like the future already. That's right, that's right. And he knew that, um, he knew, look, where everyone else at the time was still trying to sound like three chord blues punk, like the Pistols, he was going towards Can and, you know, and uh, we were doing something similar, but maybe not for such, you know, intellectual reasons. But to, uh, we would, we would, you know, we were drawn to that, and and, and when, also with, with what Pearl were doing, of course, had a similar resonance. Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, John was an intellectual genius as well, Lydon, wasn't he? And so, you know, but very different from Ian. So, but both of them had a vis visionary oracular thing, you know, where they would, uh, you know, channel this stuff through. It's, it's interesting that in the North you get these people, and, you, and often now you think about where do they get the information? How do they find this stuff? Because I know there was like comic shops and underground papers, and but it's, it wasn't that easy. It's not like now you just Google it all, is it? No, but you had stronger communities of teachers and students, and they turn you on to that stuff and you see it's one of those osmosis and once you tap into something like can and you suddenly mean people who are into can you know it's a weird one but i'm sure that happened there john peel john peel yeah yeah I mean, how did you get to work with connie plank we'd um we were talking about this earlier we'd actually gone we were checking out other producers and we went to see uh martin hannah strawberry studios and um I did, I did, I, I, John was saying, I don't know if that would have worked, you know, maybe it wouldn't actually, you're right. But I actually love Martin and Hannah's production because I just loved all the reverb and stuff, his vision of it. Um, but of course, when we met him, I, when I found out that 10 CCs in the end, um, uh, I'm Not In Love was made in the same studio, that's all I wanted to talk about. And he was like, well, I didn't do that. I wasn't here, though. I'm going, but where did they do this? For some reason, it didn't work very well. But um, I, I think we had a list of a few other producers. Mine, Trevor Horn was on it, actually. And, uh, and of course, um, who we ended up working with um, in the end, anyway, was uh, with... Um, uh, Can, Can's producer, Connie Black. Con, with Connie. Connie was the only one we could actually all agree on working with. He did a great job. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was an amazing experience. But it's not a best album. Although a lot of our fans love it. I love it. But I think it's a bit dirty. I don't know, maybe it's a mix. It all sounds a bit... It's not what, what I was trying to do with a band like that prior to that was this sort of fusion of disco and dub with some loud guitars and I, I had to let go of that by the time we did the third album because can, I was... Can you, can you bring that bit back? I, I always like the disco and crunch. I always think you're one of the greatest funk bands that ever Oh been. yeah, well I'm still, yeah. well, I'm still totally... It's in there and the intense... Disco centric. I, I love know. the groove in Killing Joe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the groove kind of went away a bit on the third album. We got rid of choruses and it just became this sort of blunt, dirgy sort of Pile juggernaut. Um, it sounded great when you were 18. <laughs> maybe, yeah. I, was, yeah. I never thought it was a great album, but working with Connie was great. Mm -hmm. And we, I met Holger Kazuki, and actually, what was amazing on that trip was Wobble was over doing an EP with Jackie Leebridge and Holger, and he was only 22. And I was, uh, he was, well, I must have been about 23, he's a bit older than me. I was like 21. I was like, Jesus, Wobble's working with Jackie at 22, I better get busy, <laughs> yeah. you know. I kind of really thought, shit, I've got to, you know, yeah. speed up a bit. <laughs> and the final question from this corner, yeah. Hi. Um, yes, whether it's the inclusiveness or, or the androgyny or something else entirely, what do you hope that new bands now take from the old days and carry into the future with golf? I think, again, I think the, the answer's in the question, I think, if they, they take the atrogeny and they take... Also, the, uh, this, the style of the musical influences, which I think are very interesting, because it was never straight rock and roll, was it? it it's influenced by yeah. funk, disco, dub, mm -hmm. like you just saying, and quite a lot of the bands were. The sense of adventure, and also the, that embrace of melancholy, but not drowning in, I think, support as well. Mm -hmm. 
I think all those kind of things, but not copying it, I think that every generation has to have its uh, its own narrative and its own soundtrack. I mean, it's, and that's what it is, you know, people do, I think younger people now are probably more open to older musics, but I don't want them, I wouldn't want them to be drowned in it, you know, you don't want another version, 18 year old kid version of Killing Joke, but you want maybe some people to take that influence to make something completely different out of it. Yeah, I mean, if you look at like, uh, pop stars today, Billy Irish, well, I mean, they're, they're pretty inclusive, they're pretty mm. open to uh, lots of different things going on. I mean, it's not going to be the same as the back mm. but I'm Is sure they're going to get... It's great though, isn't it? Oh yeah, and actually, look at the influence of Bauhaus alone, I mean, I mean, Massive Attack cover, Bella Lugosi Live, and I've done for a while, and... Yeah. So many people are into that vibe now from 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 across platform uh, disciplines. Mm. Um, it's taken on its own life, you know. Um, but again, yeah, we we want more artists that uh, facilitate that kind of inclusion, you know, um, and and can promote people to feel like they belong, whoever they are, wherever they're from. Um, that's what we want. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Or not just art, it's just, just basically the human race. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, speaking of inclusion, thanks everybody for coming tonight. And, uh, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, John. And uh, thank you. And let's see, yeah, let's see, let's give a big hand for John and his masterpiece. Yes. Yes. Our success there is going to go bigger and bigger. And, uh, and it's great to talk about it. Thank yeah, you. Just, yeah, and we're going to be signing about. Five ten minutes over there, and, and, and use book as well. These oh yes, Slaves yeah. of Venus, uh, some poetry I've written. So yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah.